All right. Hello, Fortinas, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is April 14th, 2024. I know many are counting down the days. We're just a little under four months from what we have been watching for for, oh, a year now to the time we are so patiently while being diligently seeking and searching him. Man. It's going it, to, four months is going to feel like a long time, but I sure hope it flies by fast. And today, guys, what we're going to do, we're going to spend some time. I'm, I did a, a bunch of word searching, um, and we're going to spend some time in really the, the focus for me started in Luke chapter 11 in relation to all of the, this conversation about light, lighted, lighting. It's It's all over the place. And then how it leads into everything speaking about this remnant what we call a remnant bride a the 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 portion of the pre-trib bride that is going there uh, uh, oh sorry of the pre-trib bride that is going there is a remnant that is going to remain that is going to be chosen by the lord they are voluntary soldiers as we've been showing we've been talking about this group and understanding their preparation happening here in part for years now. And today, as I was doing this word search over the last couple of days and seeing where it leads from, from where we're starting with this light in Luke 11 and, and seeing how it goes often into Romans, how it goes often into 1 Peter or, or Peter in general, how it goes often into the book of Ephesians. And it, it, the connections within it are incredible. And I've been wanting to do a study on Ephesians for a while. I just haven't gotten around to it. And today we're going to be covering so much. So we're not going to get into every detail of Ephesians. But I mean, just go with, with the end time eyes of understanding. You go and read Ephesians with what we've understood here. And just <laughs> the whole conversation. It's almost like uh, when going to First Peter. And you see the this entire conversation going to this group of people, this preordained people, a group chosen from the Lord, a group called out from the Lord to serve him. And when you see, as we've been able to see with what we call this revelation, this opening of end time eyes, it's it's astounding to see how clear it gets. You know, my wife got me all fired up the other night, too. She was reading the book of John again, and I come in to get ready for bed, and she's just like, man, I am so grateful for, for the revelation you've been given because obviously my wife hears it from me all the time. And uh, she, she says, you know, to be able to read the book now, to, to be able to go into, for example, the Gospel of John because that's where she was, and to be able to read and have an understanding of, of what's being shared. You know, especially this creations story that we talk about from John chapter one. We're going to touch a little bit on that today. One, because she fired me up for it the other night, but it's a lead in to what we're talking about because we're talking about the light, which is Christ, that will light a remnant group of workers. That's kind of the theme tonight. When he comes in the darkness to shed his light. That's the theme. I'm sure the title will also be something along those lines. Before we get started, we are going to touch on, you know, some of the the now situation of where we are and what people are looking at. And and I'll reiterate a couple of things and and give people a, a, a strengthening reminder in, in the sense of let's not forget what has been revealed, especially if you've been around for a while there to me. It has been revealed. The question that that remains is as confident as we are in what's been revealed for 2024 and what points to 2024 being the year. You know, I, I've never been more confident in that in my life. However, there is no thus saith the Lord. It's through revelation of scripture that's been happening here for over six and a half years. And when it comes to the when of this beginning, I believe I understand it as I've said it. It's been a while since I said it, but I have, I believe I have understood it now as well as I understand 
the revelation of who the Gospels are speaking to and the revelation of the 14 years. That is how confident I am as to the timing of the true Feast of Weeks at the time of the pre-trib escape. And as you know, that's not a that's not a little thing for me to say. It's not a thus saith the Lord, but neither is the revelation of the Gospels. Neither is the revelation of the true end of days of 14 years and a little bit above. These things are fact from Scripture to those who are given eyes to see and ears to hear and a heart to receive it that go in and diligently seek and search these things out. And so I believe, you know, even within myself, for me to to be able to say something like that, that I believe we've understood when it will all begin isn't something that I take lightly, not even in the slightest. So it doesn't mean people can't look at other dates and be searching at other things and so forth. Of course not. But we always need to be diligently seeking and searching them out because it's not always about the when. It's his whole story, right? It's from the beginning of creation to the end of Revelation. And that's what we talk about. We go from Genesis 1 to the end of Revelation. So with that, my coffee. With that, those are some of the things. That's what we're going to be delving into today. Um, I was shared another video. I didn't watch the whole thing um, from our sister Trisha in relation to Dana Coverstone. Uh, it looks like he's really, really struggling. I think I may have mentioned it in the last video. We know he's in the hospital and he was having more issues, it seemed like. I haven't watched the whole thing, though. So, uh, you know, a prayer for our brother, uh, David, uh, uh, Dana Coverstone. Uh, you know, he did a lot to to get people excited and, and seeing that that's, things were building and things are coming with these with the dreams and some of the visions that he's had. So with that, uh, lift up Dana Coverstone in your prayers and and uh, let's see if the Lord will 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 reveal a healing in his will. All right. So with that. As always, if anybody's new to the ministry, especially when you've heard things like I was just talking about, if you've just clicked onto this ministry and you're hearing things like <clears throat> the differences, who the Gospels are speaking to and, and and 14 years of tribulation. I mean, this guy must be nuts. It's seven years. Everybody knows it. Well, no, everybody thinks they've understood that it's seven years. But when you realize what we have here in this intro series Go in and watch the first four videos. The, the first video, it's this picture right here, is a 22-minute intro into the next three videos. The second video is the video that will begin. It's a 30-minute Bible study to show you the differences in the Gospels that if any of you have studied the Scriptures, you will know there are clear differences within the Gospels that the church has never been able to make sense of in telling us, well, it's just a perspective. Clearly, things aren't just perspective when, for example, in, in Luke, you see Jesus going to the cross in a gorgeous robe. It means white, radiant, beautiful. In Mark, he's arrayed in purple, and in Matthew, he's arrayed in scarlet. I always say these people weren't colorblind, so what's the issue? It's prophecy. The differences within the Gospels reveal prophecy and we have shown it here in this ministry in dozens and dozens and dozens of scriptures within the Gospels themselves. <clears throat> it's, it's an incredible thing. It's beautiful to see. And once you see it, you will go, oh, man. You will understand why the Lord said the first shall be last and the last will be first. Matthew, Mark, Luke of the Synoptic Gospels in the end of days goes Luke, Mark, Matthew. Pre, mid, post you ever wonder why everybody argues if pre mid or post is true and they'll they'll debate each other and all of them can go to scripture to prove their point that's right that's because pre mid and post is all true and it takes place over a period of 14 years and a little portion above which is 50 days long the pre-trib happens at the 50 days above and then you have the 50 days, then you have your seven years of seals. In your seventh year of seals, in the seventh year, is your great multitude mid-trib rapture of Revelation chapter 7. That is the Mark group. That is for the sleeping church, the, the world as a whole, the Gentiles that are grafted into the house of Israel scattered throughout the world. And then you've got your post, which is the return of the Lord feet down on the Mount of Olives, 
which is his end of Matthew, which is the end of the six years of trumpets. The Lord will return for that seventh year and will destroy all of the enemies, uh, uh, cast the false prophet and the beast into the lake of fire and bind Satan for a thousand years. And then when that final 14th year is over, it'll be the beginning of it'll be the Jubilee, <coughs> excuse me, and the beginning of the millennial reign. That's what you will come to see in the third video. The Luke group is the pre-trib, that Gentile bride of Christ. And in the third one is what you will see in a 30-minute intro of what I just explained in that 14 years of tribulation and the portion called above. The fourth video is a big video. It's about a two-hour and 45-minute Bible study. And that one is the revelation of how all of this was missed. I used to, a long time ago, think it was maybe deception within the, the, the far depths of the church, but no. It simply wasn't time. It has been revealed over the past six and a half years because now was the time, and the Lord chooses who he wills. And that's all I could say. I have no idea why we've understood it and why it hadn't been sooner. I don't know why you guys are led and it's going out through us. I, I don't know. But the evidence of it happening is 100% crystal clear that it's happening. The books are being opened and the revelation of the true time of the end is being made known to a group that I believe and many of us believe are being prepared to serve them in the time of the end. All right. So definitely come watch the first four videos. Then once you start to get a grasp, then you can keep going deeper into the videos that are after it. Uh, you can also go to ministryrevealed.com by clicking the link right here. When you do, you can go to the tab for intro and you could watch the first four videos there and then follow the next videos in order once you got a grasp on the first four. I promise you it is worth every single moment of your time if you're diligent in seeking scripture, if you've been trying to understand prophecy, if you've known things just weren't adding up or you've had questions here or there within it, I promise you, we may not answer all the questions, but far more than you have ever had answered before. And I promise, like I said, it'll be worth every moment of your time. So having said that, let's go into where we are right now. I'm not going to spend a ton of time here because we've got some great videos on this. Uh, if somebody wants to go back, <clears throat> we have some great, great videos. Where is one on this? Why and when 2024? Extremely, extremely laid out details about it. Now, in the past, like even at about earlier, you know, a little over a year ago from where we are now, I was still considering two periods of time. And one of the main reasons was because we still hadn't yet <clears throat> received what I would say that final piece of the puzzle. And what I mean by that is we even had the piece of the puzzle, but it was almost like a, a, a little one of those little, uh, uh, you know, like a little nub that sticks off one of the sides. It was almost like that piece was broken off. And we, we couldn't quite finish the puzzle because we were missing that one little piece. And it was so important for the whole picture of everything that was around it to come together. And once that was revealed last year at about this time, it was a done deal. It was only a matter now of was that going to be the year? And of course, it wasn't last year. And I told everybody we're going to have one more year to go. And when I did that, it was like shooting myself in the foot because a lot of people then said, well, we're not going to diligently seek anymore because we're only looking for the date. You see, but we continue to be diligent. We continue to seek and search him out to draw closer and closer to him, to be prepared and ready for him at his revelation. So what was it last year? Well, now that we're coming up to this time again, this would have been a time last year when we were all eyes for the count of the seven Sabbaths to begin in Nisan last year. 
Now, why am I not looking to this being the count this year? Okay. When we did the count, you know, seven Sabbath starts on the 22nd of Nisan for the first one. There's one, two, three, because the true Sabbaths are the 8th, 15th, 22nd, and 29th of every month. All you got to do is follow the moon. It could be off based on how the calendar is laid out. Maybe it's off by a day, one side or the other. <clears throat> but generally, you're going to find it exactly laid out. And what you find out is this would be the count. One, two, three, four, five, six. Oops. And, of course, the 22nd of Nisan would be your first Sabbath. Uh, there's your second Sabbath. Third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and then seventh. So the world will say this is Feast of Weeks or Pentecost. They combine it together, and we know that that's not true. We know that the truth is it's seven Sabbaths and then shall you number 50 days. We have proven it out. It's not even a question. However, what you have to understand are the things that we've revealed over this over the past several months, over this past year. How on earth can you begin a seven Sabbath count from when the when the sickle is being put to the wheat. There is no such thing as wheat, depending on, how, you see, this was a second Adar year, either in here or into April, March into April. There is no such thing as wheat being ready because the Feast of Weeks, you're told in Scripture, in Deuteronomy and in Numbers, Deuteronomy 16, Numbers 28, we are told that, as we know, the Feast of Weeks is for the wheat harvest. We've proven why the Jews count from here, because they're using the wrong wheat, and they're not using sickle, they're not putting the sickle and cutting down the wheat, they're using the spring wheat that's planted here, waiting till it's ready in the fall, cutting it down, bringing it to Passover of the next year, putting it in, in, in a bushel or whatever, in a bucket, and then they're counting seven weeks. That is not what Scripture said. Scripture says from when you begin to put the sickle to the wheat. The sickle to the wheat does not begin, depending on the year, <clears throat> late May to about middish June. This year is a second Adar year. We know that the sickle is being put to the wheat in this time frame right here of about middish june sometimes it could be late may but it's late may into about middish june depending on the year when you do this what 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 was the big deal for us we knew the harvests and we can literally go to the different the two different wheat harvests of the earth as well as the grape harvest and line it up exactly to what Scripture said and land on the days that Scripture had revealed. So we know that from counting from the 16th of Savan, Savan or June 22nd this year, we count what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven Sabbaths. And what happens? You got it. This is the time frame of the beginning of the winter wheat harvest, and this is the end of it. When the seven Sabbaths are over, then shall you number 50 days. From the ninth of Av to the last day of the year, Elul 29, is exactly 50 days. And anywhere from middish September to early October is the grape harvest season. Because that true Pentecost was new wine. Okay? And what was the big thing that, 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 that little piece of the puzzle that was missing? Because otherwise, if it wasn't for that little piece, we would be all eyes at a count from here. We would be looking at a seven Sabbath count, even this year from right here, if it wasn't 
for a key piece. And why? Because when you do a seven Sabbath count in Nissan, though you're ignoring actual wheat, and you get to the true seventh Sabbath right here, we know from the pre-trib escape, there is a seven-day wedding. And then the Lord returns on the eighth day to begin his 40 days. What is the 15th to the 16th of Savan? It's Jesus' birthday. We have shown, we used to bounce back and forth as it did, and then it was made known. We, we have locked it in. We know it. Ivan has done some studies. Our brother from South Africa, he's done some studies. We, we've gone to see the guy who was um, in a planetarium. He was an atheist. He became a Christian after he saw by studying scripture to, to prove it out in the stars to do a teaching uh, uh, for just people coming to the planetarium. We saw the guy who's been traveling for decades around the world showing that Jesus was born, not only that Jesus was born in June, but that he was born in the third month okay the th hebrew third month which now is the month of savan which is of course taurus and for the longest time we had known that when the sab seventh sabbaths are done if this was the true count then the lord returning on the eighth day being connected to his birthday Bam, we were on fire last year for that. But one thing never lined up. Wheat. Wheat. The wheat never lined up. We even know from, from, the, uh, from the, the, the calendar, from the sun, moon, and stars, we know that the sun has gone off course for two months, and the spirit revealed to us Taurus, which is the month of Savant which back in the beginning is where it was in Taurus. Well, that's exactly two months off, right? So if you went 16th of Nisan, 16th of Ayar, to the 16th of Savan, that's two months. Yes, it's from in the thir first month to in the third month. There's two months between them. So there's this offness of two months. Well, when you realized the wheat harvest differences and you realized where the Jews were counting from and that it was impossible to be putting the sickle to the wheat or er, in early spring when it's just starting to grow when when all of these things come together and you realize that in fact everything begins to be counted in the third month then you're left scratching your head because how can a count for the Feast of Weeks begin here if the connection to the end of days and Jesus coming at the time of his birth when he's going to fulfill the, jo uh, the, the Jonah 40 days in the is to come, how is he going to do it from his birthday when it really isn't even connected to the wheat? This, this would just be the beginning of the wheat harvest. How can the Son of Man come for 40 days before the pre-trib group has even gone and before the, the, the 50 days? Because the 50 days, when they end, it has to be the Feast of Trumpets. So there was, it, it, when you see it and understand it, it becomes so crystal clear. But that one little nub piece of the puzzle was so vastly important. Because it revealed the difference of two months that we had been seeking forever. You see, we have known this passage of 2 Corinthians chapter 12 for about six and a half years now. In October, about October 2017, is when the revelation of the 14 years began. And there was always this mystery of the word above. We, d we ended up finding out within a year or so that the above was 50 days. And in fact, it was less than that. It was maybe about six months later that it began. I used to go to um, Zechariah chapter 7, 14 chapters in Zechariah. We, we revealed how it equals the 14 years, just like Hosea, one to the Gentiles, one to the Jew. 
And we've broken that down now many times over the years. Well, in Zechariah chapter 7, this was an important piece of scripture that we had spoken about for a long time. And then it went on the back burner. And then it would be brought forth. And then it would go to the back burner. But this was the answer. Because it was the 50 days. It says, when you fasted, everything is past tense, in the fifth month and in the seventh month, those 70 years. Which means in chapter 7 being seven years later from when you did that for 70 years, as we used to teach in chapter 1, saying these 70 years in chapter 1 of Zechariah. And it's about fasting and mourning in the fifth month and in the seventh month. And it said, when you were doing it for those 70 years, you were inhabiting the land, you were prosperous, you were in the south of the plain, but since those 70 years, you have not been. And we knew this. We, we had broken it down for a long time. But guess what? When you're trying to figure it out, <clears throat> and this is the true Feast of Weeks, or you're believing that this time frame, this is what they would say, and when you do a proper weeks count, you would think that it's the 8th of Savan. How do you get the 8th of Savan and then try to count out 50 days and end up sometime in, in late Tammuz, and that's where the 14 years of tribulation is going to start? It didn't make any sense. Something wasn't lining up because Scripture had revealed from the fasting of the morning of the fifth month, which is the ninth of Av, you've got 50 days to the year's end to the day, uh, uh, not only day and hour, but to the fasting and the morning of the seventh month because of the attack, attack one and attack two. So for a long time, we had understood this count that went from here to here, but there was no way that we can we could have biblically figured it out with the information we had still at that time. We needed that little nub, that little piece. Because what happened last year at about this time, we got the revelation of Isaiah 9, knowing that the light affliction that happens in two northern cities of Israel in the is to come, that was prophesied in the was of what happened, Jesus fulfilled in the is, is going to play out in typology in the is to come. And what happened? Well, it said that there would be a light affliction in the land of Zebulun and Naphtali. We know that this light affliction is the attack that is going to come about by Iran on the destruction of Haifa and Tel Aviv. Now, most of you here already know this. You've been around long enough that is what is coming but it is not coming until the pre-trib happens the escape the pre-trib escape happens and bam then the bombs drop on the 9th of Av would be the date of this fifth and seventh month this is the fifth month fasting and mourning where this light affliction is going to come before a bigger affliction comes. So after this light affliction comes, what do we know happens? Well, we know the pre-trib is gone after the seventh Sabbath. The attack happens. There's going to be a seven-day wedding in heaven. And the Lord is going to return on the eighth day to fulfill 40 days as Jonah did. When he comes, he is coming to shed his light. He is coming to shine his light in the darkness. He will be here for 40 days. Once his 40 days are over, not many days, three days, and it's the anointing of the Holy Ghost, that true Pentecost, before what? The greater affliction that happens at the one that is the seventh month. It is the revelation of the above 14 years. And what do we read? After this light affliction, 
There's later going to be a more grievous one. But what happens between the light affliction and the bigger one happening? It says the people walked in darkness that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death upon them hath the light shined. And then look, it seems like his birth for unto us. A child is born for unto us. A son is given. We've shown this in a couple places that it seems to be related to his birth. So for the longest time until last year, <clears throat> we track this. We do the seventh Sabbaths. We end up here and then he'd be coming at his birth. Until what, brothers and sisters? Until what? You see, then Syria is coming and that is going to be the bigger destruction. That's the one at the seventh month. So what did we know when Jesus came to fulfill this, to be the light in the darkness? We found out that he fulfilled it in the is. For those that don't know, was is from creation until Christ. Is is from Christ until the moment of the pre-trib. And from the moment of the pre-trib to the end is the was, uh, is the is to come. Was, is, and is to come. So what did we get? Well, then we found out that Jesus fulfilled this in the is in Matthew chapter four. It says, now, when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed unto Galilee, leaving Capernaum over to the coast, that it might be fulfilled, spoken by Isaiah, the prophet, saying the land of Zebulun and Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people which sat in darkness saw, uh, saw great light. This was that fulfillment from the was into the is. And again, until we had, we had the puzzle piece now, but we were missing that little nub because it still seemed to relate to here because Isaiah told us that it was connected to his birth for unto us a child is born. Just like Luke chapter four. So we thought those 40 days as his birth would be connected to his birth. But then we were given the answer. We were revealed this that little nub piece that was missing, which you all know is this right here. Now, when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison. This was one of my most exciting, I mean, the, the revelation of all these things have been astronomically incredible. And I, I will often say, guys, whenever you get bummed, you're like, oh, man, you know, is there going to be something new? Is there going to be more revelation? Just consider the hundreds of revelations we've been given. Just consider them and go back, spend some time in them, study them deeper. But this one right here, in, in the clinching moment that we were looking for, having understood the rest, but this had slipped my understanding when I first read through it. Until I went back after that day had passed, that same night, I ended up getting revealed going back and reading it when it said that John was cast into prison. Because what did that mean? That means... Jesus did not fulfill it at his birthday, even though Isaiah 9 seems to tell us that when he did, it was at his birth. See, a child is born unto us, a son is given. Why wouldn't we think that the 40-day connection is to his birth? We needed Matthew chapter 4, to reveal to us and to show that it wasn't actually exactly at Jesus's birth. Because if you remember in Luke chapter three, it says when John baptized Jesus, Jesus began to be about 30 years old, which means John was still around. And when Jesus was baptized and he began to be 30 at the time of his birthday, he did not fulfill Matthew chapter 4 yet because John was still around. 
Remember, Jesus goes into the wilderness for 40 days. He comes back. He chooses disciples, right? They, they follow him. <clears throat> then they go and they're baptizing. And when they go and baptize, John chapter 3 says John was baptizing with his guys in another area. That's because John was still around for about two months as the history books reveal. It was approximately two months before John was cast into prison. And then John was in prison for about 10 more months before he was beheaded. That difference was what? Jesus did not fulfill Matthew chapter 4 until he heard that John was in prison. And John was not put into prison at the time of Jesus' baptism, obviously, it was about two months later, and you could track it in Scripture. And when you go two months later, you end up at the 15th to the 16th month uh, day of the month of Av. Well, guess what? Weren't we off by two months trying to scratch our head for years? We were two months off because of the calendar, because of how the sun had moved. And there had to be a making up of two months somehow that would be revealed in Scripture to line up with the true harvests. And that little puzzle piece, that little piece that was broken off that I found on the floor in the carpet was the piece that revealed that John was now cast into prison which means Jesus did not fulfill Matthew chapter 4 as Isaiah 9 said until two months after his birthday. Well, guess what? In the is to come revelation of it, this is when Jesus comes on the eighth day after what? The count from the true feast of weeks and then the beginning of the 50-day count, the light affliction happening on Haifa and Tel Aviv, and then seven-day wedding, and the Lord returning on the eighth day to begin his 40 days, as Jonah did. It is absolutely this right here. Was it just this with Isaiah that revealed? No! It took us six, or at that time, about five and a half years to get that revelation. That's why I'm saying I don't say this lightly. When I say I am as confident in understanding this time frame as I am the revelation of the Gospels and the revelation of the 14 years and above. It's not just that piece. It goes all the way back and has been building and building and building and piece after piece after piece till we got the picture. And we were no longer looking at this feast and that feast and this event and that event. Because the final pieces came into place. And when that final piece came into place, we found the little nub that was broken off. That completed the picture. And that is one of the big reasons outside of what Scripture obviously revealed. <clears throat> Not only does this end seven years from the Revelation 12 sign, and we'll start the 14 years of tribulation. But it is also in this ministry, six and a half years of diligently seeking and searching and going from feast and event like everybody else was and diligently ser searching in those things in Scripture where we were able to narrow it down. <clears throat> excuse me, and narrow it down and narrow it down and narrow it down until the final piece came in. And everything that compassed it, when that little piece went in, it was like all the arrows were pointing to it. That's it. And for the past year, as many have grumbled and groveled, me included, I've been also comfortable in it. I'm, I'm definitely impatient. These next four months are going to seem probably long. But I believe we're here. 
And I absolutely believe this timing right here, depending where you are in the world, this timing right here is the pre-trib, as we've been saying for over a year now, or about a year now. We don't need to look to this count here because there is no wheat. And I just proved to you with Scripture that it's not connected to his birthday. But the count is two months after his birthday. When Remember, when he comes at this time, when he comes after Iran strikes Haifa and Tel Aviv, when he comes at that point, the pre-trib has happened, Haifa and Tel Aviv are struck. There's going to be a short Middle East war that will last for about that week until it is settled. And then the Lord's going to show up as the Son of Man, as he said he would, as Jonah did. Do you know when he shows up? Do you know what he tells us? That he's going to be the light in the darkness. That he is going to be the light in the darkness. When he is that light in the darkness, what do we know he's going to do? He's going to give his light to the remnant workers. So that they can go and shine his light for all of his people who are still in darkness to see. And I'm going to show that to you tonight more clearly than we had seen it in relation to him shining his light than ever before. Remember what it said in John chapter 1? In the beginning was the word. Who is the beginning? Jesus. You know, I've had people come against me and say, oh, that, you're crazy, you don't know, that's not Jesus. What are you talking about? All you have to do is go study it. Go look at what the word beginning means. Go to Genesis chapter 1. So in the beginning was the word to Genesis 1, in the beginning God created. We've shown many times the word beginning is the feast of first fruits, right? The one without leaven, Jesus. He is the feast of first fruits, which means in Jesus, God the Father created. And people say, oh, no, you're crazy. Oh, really? Let me show you something. We're going to be going into this later <clears throat> as it relates to other contexts of things we're going to be talking about. But let me show it to you. Watch this. Ephesians 3, 9. And to make all men see. Oh, just wait till we get to this. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. The mystery. You see... Paul had the mystery. Paul's mystery was the salvation for the Gentiles about Christ. We have the mystery of the end of days. We have end time eyes, as I've said for years. We look through these things with an end time vision that has never been made known before. That's what we've been given to see. When we relate to this, we are talking about this mystery. This mystery being revealed. The mystery of the end of days coming to light. So what does it say? To, uh, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery from, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God. Now listen to this. In God who created all things by Christ Jesus. So anybody who wants to tell you that the word beginning doesn't mean Jesus, go read Ephesians 3, 9 to them. From which the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things. So the Father created all things by Jesus Christ. The word beginning means Jesus. In Christ, God created the heavens and the earth, the heaven and the earth. He gave it all to his son and said, go and create. And Jesus was so excited. He started, it was all the spirit portion of everything. And he was so excited. That's why it only flew, that's why it flew by with only two verses called what, what the world relates to as gap theory. 
And what do we see in verse 2? And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So you have Jesus, you have the Father, and you have the Spirit. You have the Trinity right there, verse 1 and 2, in the beginning of the entirety of the book from creation. But guess what? From John chapter 1, we can now understand the beginning. Jesus was the beginning. Jesus is God. He is God the Son, and he was with God, who is the Father. The same was in the beginning with God. Hello. It's not hard to understand. <clears throat> Put on those end time eyes. And then what happens? Watch this. Verse 4, John 1. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Okay? So we had the was in creation. We have the is at the time of Christ's birth. And then we have and is to come, which is the fractal picture of it all. So now what does it say? Verse 5. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Wait a second. All of a sudden we've got light shining in darkness. They that walked in darkness have seen a great light. You have a picture of something that was a was that Jesus fulfills in an is. And we know that there's a prophetic picture of the was and is in the is to come. And here we're showing the is of the creation. Jesus was what? Jesus was the light. What does it say? And there was a man sent from God whose name was John. Right? John the Baptist. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light. Brothers and sisters, do you know who that light is? Of course you do. That light is Jesus Christ. We're going to see it as we get into the story of the light. Jesus is that light. And that light is a word used often in Scripture 70 times. It is him as fire and light. Okay? It's Jesus who is the light. Well, what happens when you go back to Genesis 1? In chapter 3, I mean in verse 3, what does it say? And God said, let there be light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. You seeing a pattern? <laughs> I think there's a pattern, right? It was darkness and then came light. Who was this light? We've shared on it many times. If, if you guys go and watch that intro series and go all the way to the deep, deep stuff, you're going to see the video called a fractal. It will blow your mind. But don't just jump there because then it will wreck your mind. You won't be able to track it. Jesus is the light. Are we making this up? No, John repeated it for us. So if Jesus here is made light, obviously he's not the sun and the moon because the sun and the moon were created on the fourth day. Hello. Jesus was the light over the darkness. And the darkness comprehended it not. Jesus is the light. So what are we seeing here? John the Baptist was a witness to the light who is Christ. Which means John the Baptist had to be part of the spirit group in this gap theory creation. John is a prophetic picture of a remnant group of workers who are called his witnesses who bore witness of the light who came after the spirit portion. We know this. If you guys remember those studies we've done, we go into Romans 8. Remember the spirit of God in Genesis 1, 2? You see, those who are not condemned, who are in Christ, who walk after the spirit and not the flesh, we are told that they are what? In Romans 8, 14, for as many as are led by the spirit of God, 
Genesis 1 verse 3, they are what? The sons of God. So John, John the Baptist is a prophetic type of the sons of God who are led by the Spirit because John was born with the Spirit. And what did it call John? It called John a witness. We know that the only group of workers during the end of days, there's only one group from the end of Luke compared to the end of Mark compared to the end of Matthew. There is only one group who are called his witnesses. And it's the ones that he opens up the understanding of all things for the time of the end. And he tells them in Luke 24, 48, and you are witnesses of these things. He does not say it in Mark. He does not say it in Matthew. This is why it's important to really delve in deep and to understand the differences within the Gospels so that you can see the prophetic insight and implication laid out everywhere through them to the pre-group, the seals group, the trumpets group, and the workers throughout them through to the end of the millennial reign. Jesus is coming after what? After the spirit group is taken out. When the spirit group is taken out, when that pre-trib Gentile bride of Christ is taken out, he's keeping for himself a John group, a remnant worker John group, who will be what? Witnesses of the light. Who are the ones that are spirit portioned, who also have light in them and will be filled with the light of Christ to do work as John did. Do you understand why in Mark when we get to the transfiguration in Mark and Jesus says John already came and they did with him whatsoever they wanted. And we know that prophetically in the end of days, John is a prophetic picture of an Elijah and a Moses. The one who is beheaded, the one who didn't get to go into the promised land and the Elijah who goes up in a whirlwind like the great multitude rapture, that two portions those putting their necks on the line, those who will make it through, not having died. This witness group of workers who are working during seals to bring about the great multitude rapture group. They're the John types. They're being, they're the witnesses to his light. That's why the Elijah is going to, as we've shown in other videos, Elijah is the one who does like John, who prepares the way, right? Who will uh, um, bring, reunite father and son, mother and daughter. We know that they're divided during seals, and by the end of it, they're reunited. It's the Elijah type, who is the John. And John, who is also as a Moses, who died not being able to go into the promised land for Moses. And John, who when Christ came, took over which is a picture of Christ at the end of the sixth year of seals, who will take over as the, as the, as the uh, uh, Joshua type and who will bring them into the promised land for the great multitude rapture into paradise, which is where the great multitude rapture of the mid-trib goes as this one right here. The first one goes to the third heaven. That's the pre-trib Gentile bride of Christ. The was caught up to paradise is the great, mid-trib multitude rapture so we can see these things we understand that this is what's happening we've broken these things down and we understand this darkness into light and there are witnesses of it there are witnesses who are the john types who will bear witness in the darkness well when does the darkness happen well according to isaiah the darkness has to happen after the pre-trib. Then the darkness happens from that first attack. But it's also, don't forget, tens of millions of people will have vanished. So it's not only the darkness of that attack. It's the darkness of the spirit group having been taken from the earth. It'll be chaos when tens of millions of people vanish. And there's a group being that we're told 
in Luke chapter 12 that told us that he is going to be going to the wedding and when he comes back to be ready. And when he comes back, he's coming back to this John group who are in the darkness, who are going to receive his light. They're going to be with him for the meal, as Luke 24 says, and they're going to then go out from Jerusalem before the attack and then go throughout the whole earth. It's the remnant workers who will have his light to go out and shine, having been witnesses of the light. It's so awesome when you can see, when you can comprehend these things. It really just, it's, it's awesome. Look what happens now. You also know, as we've shown, we have Hosea has 14 chapters and it's written to the Gentiles. Zechariah has 14 chapters. It's written to the Jews. We just explained chapter 7 and how important that was over the years. That was part of building the puzzle. And now we know also, for years now, how John has 21 chapters because it is a picture of the big picture. Seven years, which are quote-unquote called easy years, which relate to the, the Revelation 12 sign. Then you've got seven years and seven years we've broken it down we've got videos on these teachings it's incredible so look at what happens when we come to john chapter 8 here jesus comes and it says and the scribes and pharisees brought into him brought unto him a woman taken in adultery now we know that the word adultery we've talked on this many times over the years it's been a while since we've shared on it again though but the word adultery Yes, she was taken in adultery, but it could also mean Gentile, just like Ruth. You go to the book of the Ruth, I think chapter 3, maybe chapter 2, and it says, Why have you looked upon me in such a way, a stranger? And you go to the word stranger in Hebrew, and one of the definitions for it is an adulterer. Okay? Is it because Ruth was an adulteress? No. It's a term sometimes used as Gentiles. This Gentile, though, is this Gentile a picture of the pre-trib bride? Or is she maybe more so? As we've passed through the years now, is she maybe more so a picture of the remnant bride portion? You see, here he is. Jesus is stooped down. He's before her. He lifts himself up. And says, he that it was without sin, let him cast the first stone. And he stooped down again. Remember, I've always said it's like he's on his knees or on a knee, stooped over, and she's the one left standing before him. Okay? We've shared on it many times. It's almost like he's there proposing to her. But when we get to verse 11 in John 8, he says, she said, no man, my Lord, because nobody was left accusing him or anything. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Now, that'd be nice to not sin anymore, right? But as long as we're in the flesh, there is still sin. So what is the prophetic typology here? Do you think maybe, just maybe, it's his remnant bride? When he tells her, this go and sin no more, that the remnant workers, this power and the authority and the things that they're going to be given, they're going to be given understanding. As we've seen from Luke 24, they're going to receive the Holy Ghost in, in a power of anointing never before seen on the earth, way greater than what it was when Christ came the first time and the Holy Ghost came the first time. Why? Because the end of days is going to be far worse than it ever was at any time in human history. And look at what he says. Do you think this is maybe a picture of the start of his 40 days also? Verse 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Funny how that happens, right? 
all of these prophetic places that have been revealed are showing us the exact same context of timing of everything else that has been revealed prophetically showing the timing of his coming when he starts his 40 days well let's take this into john 11 now and let's see where a bunch of this word searching takes us we're going to follow these rabbit trails of word searches and just touch on them and see how often and where they connect and see who they're talking to we've shown in luke 11 something we've spoken on many many times over the years how the revelation again when you know that the differences in luke mark and matthew are prophetic and you know that in jonah the story in luke for jonah jesus hasn't yet fulfilled it which means in mark when he says he gave them no sign and got in the ship and left it means he hasn't fulfilled that either that's because the great multitude rapture group have no sign they don't know when their great multitude rapture timing is going to be they're going to see him coming at the end of the sixth year on heavenly mount zion when the world is panicking but it's still not their rapture till about the middle of the seventh year because they get no sign and when you go to matthew it says three days and three nights in the heart of the earth we know jesus hasn't fulfilled that yet either and that's about the timing of post-trip so what is it with jonah well lo and behold the story of jonah watch this let's go into luke chapter 11 in this wonderful program called esort as you could see up here if you don't have it i think it's just a maybe a, a handful of dollars a year or free depending on on your uh device but why do i always promote it not because i'm affiliated but you can get so many all the bible translations i use kjv plus so you can have what look at this you can have at your fingertips the strong's concordance and that will multiply your understanding of what's really being said in scripture by at least tenfold without this i would not have been able to do what i do it's incredible so what do we know jesus says that there will be no sign given but the sign of jonah the prophet for as jonah was a sign unto the ninevites so shall also the son of man be to this generation when you see this type of conversation this generation he's actually talking about the final generation because you know what jesus never fulfilled this jesus never fulfilled this 40 days as jonah the world of church will tell you he has but that's because they're wrong they haven't understood what it's saying they think all of these things have been fulfilled it's impossible because Jesus did not go around warning them for 40 days that they were about to be destroyed. That's not what he did after his resurrection. It's prophecy. There was no queen of the south rising with the men in the judgment after. It's not what happened. So when we've talked about this, we understand this. This is that prophetic picture of Isaiah 9 when he's coming for 40 days after the light affliction before the great affliction. We've even shown this, and I think if I remember, later on, we're going to get into it again with, with uh, Luke chapter 19. But the triumphal entry is also another prophetic picture of the coming of the Son of Man for 40 days. In Mark, it's the end, him coming at the end of the six years of seals. In Matthew, it's him coming at the end of the, the 13 years of tribulation or at the end of the sixth year of trumpets when he's coming feet down. And only in Luke... Do you see him weeping over Jerusalem? If they had only known in this thy day the things that were come upon them, that they're about to be compassed round about and destroyed because they knew not the time of their visitation. This is prophecy too. This is what he's coming to do when he comes as Jonah for 40 days. He's warning about coming destruction. So if he's coming to warn for 40 days as Jonah. And this is a prophetic picture of him coming for, <coughs> excuse me, his 40 days. 
Isn't it interesting that the story found only in Luke chapter 11 that follows is a story filled with the word light used eight times. Five of them have different meanings. Pretty wild, right? Well, let me show you this. In Luke eleven thirty three, 33, it says, listen carefully. Watch what it says. No man, when he hath lighted a candle, puts it in a secret place, neither under a bushel, but on a candlestick. Watch this. Do you know that if you go into the story where it talks about the parable of light under a basket, look at this. In Mark 4.22, do you realize in Mark there's not even a word light? Pretty crazy, right? The other story of it comes from Luke chapter 8, which is the lamp under the basket. And this is why I was telling you, see, in a jar, in a secret place, look at what he called it. Lighted. Lighted. Now, you're not going to be able to see that. Let me change that color. But you already know it's there. Lighted. I want you to understand, this doesn't just say light, but lighted. Past tense. The candle has been lit. Okay? Listen to what it says. In Mark, there is none. Watch where this leads us. Back to Luke 11.33. No man, when he hath lighted a candle, a candle, a single candle, puts it in a secret place, neither under bushel, but on a candlestick, that they which come in may see the light. Another light. Look at this word lighted. Set on fire. There is a group of people that have that are going to be lighted who represent a candle. Aren't there seven churches which are the seven candles? And we know that Smyrna are the remnant workers that all of this is talking about. This is the only one called lighted. It's used four times, and it means to set on fire. This isn't a bad set on fire. This is the one, the candle being lit, or that is lighted, that is going to be set on fire by the Lord for the Lord. Watch this. Luke, 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 Luke. This lighted word, see? Remember this story of this lighted candle found in Luke chapter 4 is also the story found in Mark 4 and the similar one also in Matthew, I think, chapter 5. Yet only Luke's is the lighted candle. Only Luke's is that lighted candle. Okay? Let's see where the next one goes to. How about following the, the concept, following the understanding that this is relating to? We know that when he comes for the 40 days, he is shining his light in the darkness, and he's got it with a group of people who are from the spirit group as John, who will bear witness of his light, who he is lighted. Okay? This is the conversation happening. And what does it say? Neither under bushel, but on a candlestick, that they which come in may see the light. So if you know in, prof in, in the prophetic, that a group of people who are his witnesses of him coming as light, who are the Smyrna, the remnant bride workers, the, the Luke 24, the John the Baptist types, the, the Moses Elijah remnant workers, when they're lit, they've been lighted as a candle as Smyrna, who 
do they have to be the light for? What were they set on fire for? Why are they the only ones lighted, according to Scripture, so that they which come in may see the light? It's only used three times. Do you know that the root word of this light comes from, remember what I showed you earlier? Jesus. Jesus is the light, 54, 57 of the Greek, which means fire and light. And this group who has been lighted is now needing to be the light for those who come in to see it. They're the ones set on fire who are a brilliant light, having received it from Christ. And if this is now the beginning of tribulation, who are they going to be the light for? The world, right? Let me show you something, and then I'll prove it to you by the definition. Watch this. Remember these two, the two on the road to Emmaus, the, the Moses-Elijah types? They're the ones had the understanding opened unto them. They're the ones that had the meal with them and he sat and served them. They're the ones he called his witnesses. And what did it say? Luke 24, 47. Again, only found in Luke. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name. Where? Among all nations. So for the whole world. And the whole world represents what? Mark, the sleeping church, the, the world, the Gentiles grafted in that will make up the great multitude rapture. But is that it? Nope. Only Luke's group, according to the end of Mark and according to the end of Matthew, only Luke's group also adds beginning at Jerusalem. So who are they going to be a light to? They're going to be a light to all nations and to the Jews. They're going to be a light to all nations, the world, the Mark group, but they're going to begin in Jerusalem with the Jews. Do you know that that light, that they are to be a light to the people that will come in, the ones that were lighted by the Lord, set on fire to be the brilliant light shining of Christ, this light that they're to be the light for is only used three times. You want to see where it's used? What? In Matthew 24, the tribulation years of trumpets, and Mark chapter 13, the tribulation years of seals. Who is, who are the ones who are going to be the light, who are going to shine during what? Tribulation. They're the ones who are lit by the Lord, set on fire to be the light, so that those who come in will see the light of Christ. And we know, as we've been talking about, it's eyes to see in the prophetic, because it's going to be the differences in the Gospels, which are prophecy, and what did it just show us? Right here. They're going to be the light during tribulation. Funny how we know who the ones are going to be receiving the light. The remnant group as John's spirit filled. Crazy how that happens, eh? It's incredible to follow and to track these things. Now let's go to the next one. Luke 11, 34. The light of the body is the eye. This one is fairly common. You see, this one, though, in Luke eleven thirty four, 34, G3088 is also the word for candle. So it's interesting that in most cases, you'll see it as candle in relation to the topic of the lighting of the candle. But only here do you see it as light. Okay? Other illuminator, it's used 14 times. So let's have a little look to see where we see these things. So we're seeing it in the story of Matthew, as I said earlier. You find that story of lighting a candle, but it's not lighted, you see? It's just light. But the word candle is the 3088. 
In Mark 4, candle is the word 3088. In the Luke 8, similar to the Matthew and Mark 1, it's lighted, but it's also candle. But in Luke 11.33 is candle. Oh, yeah, that's right, as I was saying earlier. And then in the 11.34, we see the only time in the Luke version where it's used as light. Well, look at where else we see it. Let's go check that one out. Let's go see Luke chapter 12 and see where this one is. The light of the body is the eye, okay? And if, the eye, if an eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. We'll get to that one next. So in Luke chapter 12, we're looking for the light of 3088. Remember I said this is all connected, and it's all connected to this remnant group? Well, let's have a look at this. Luke 12, 35, a, a piece of scripture we know like the back of our hands, right? Let your loins be girt about, and your lights burning. You see what's interesting about this? Your lights burning, it comes from Luke, white, but it means what? Like a portable lamp, right? And your lights burning. Do you know why <clears throat> it's not the word lighted? Wouldn't you think <coughs> excuse me, that it would relate to the lighted? This this portion of light that we were talking about earlier. If I go back through this, this brilliant light that comes from those who were set on fire, you would think it maybe would relate to that. You know why it's not? Because this isn't Christ coming at the end of at the end of the uh, uh, the wedding, coming to start his forty days. This is the beginning. Remember, Jesus is going to meet with that remnant Smyrna, Luke twenty four remnant bride portion before the wedding. As we read in verse 36 and have many times, he is telling them to let your loins be girt about and your lights burning. When they have these lights burning, <coughs> remember they're John the Baptist, right? They are John the Baptist types. They are the spirit-filled remnant who will be witnesses of the light. We saw in Romans 8, again, as we've read many times over the last couple of years, that we are in Christ spirit-filled. It doesn't talk about light because that pre-trib group is in Christ spirit-filled. Now, do we carry in the is? In the is, do we carry the light of the Lord as well to go and shine his light on others around the world. Yes. But look at what this light is telling us. This light is telling us that it's that it's a portable light. We're carrying around like a type of portable light. No, not the the 12 no, the 10 virgins. Don't that's that's post trib stuff, all right? There there's a group that are carrying light. But it's not the light that Christ is. Because remember, if you go back again, even to John 1 and Genesis 1, they're part of the beginning group, as John the Baptist was, who was the spirit-filled one, who is a witness of the light. Okay? So when we go back to Genesis 1, we're part of that same, whoever this remnant group are. All the pre-tribbers are the spirit-filled group, the spirit of God who are the sons of God for which a group of them remain who will, wear, who will bear witness of Jesus coming as the light to shine it in the darkness. When he comes, it's not the pre-trib one when he warns them before he goes to the wedding. So they're still carrying these portable lamps. They don't have <clears throat> that that spirit-filled, if you will, light in them in that same sense, which is the light of Christ, because they, they're spirit-filled. 
But do they carry light? Yes, I think everybody in Christ spirit filled is probably carrying some light. But when Christ is coming, when he returns after the wedding and knocks and these guys answer and he goes in to sup with them as the Luke 24 and Luke 12 goes on to talk about. He's going to give them his light. Because they have to go out to be the light in the darkness of the world after his 40 days are done. Do you understand why? Jesus, it said, was made light. God then made spirit Jesus become light. When Jesus became light and you come down and see when the males and females were born and it said made what? Let us make man in our image after our likeness. What was the image? The people that don't know the revelation of the 14 years and the 21 big picture, which is the 22nd is then is then eternity. It, it's the it's the entirety of the fractal. And for those that don't know, there was a, a fantastic video that I recently did right here. The 22,000 years. That is not a starter video for you guys. But once you begin to grasp and see the revelation of all this. Hold on to your horses. Because this image was what? Well, I just proved to you from John and from Genesis that it was Jesus who was made light by the Father first. We know that Lucifer, and the, who is the cherub around the throne of Christ, who is one of them, he was made what? A beautiful light, right? And he fell. He was the one that bringing about all the corruption with those that fell with him and so forth later. But what is this image that they were made after? They were made in the image of Christ, which was light. They were, I, what did it look like? I have no idea. They were light beings. You're going to see as we talk about this and as this continues to develop, to develop, where all of this continues to lead us is incredible about seeing how when Jesus comes, to shine his light in the darkness, and he's going to impart it to that group, that remnant workers, it even tells us in with that prophetic insight, as you continue to track this, that that light is the image that we will be like Christ. What? I'm telling you, just keep tracking along. It's so wild to follow this along okay now maybe we can go back and even see some a little bit more even the connections from where we just saw this portable lamp this light from luke chapter 12 verse 35 i mean you can go in and see loins gird about Let, let's do a quick check on this watch this you find out that even john the baptist now that we've gone into these, I can go back. Let me use this one. I got so many tabs open, I don't want to open anymore. And you find out that the story of John the Baptist, well, lo and behold, are you kidding me? John the Baptist, in Matthew 3 and in Mark 1, who was it? John was clothed with camel's hair and with a girdle about his skin, uh, uh, of skin about his loins. Okay, John the Baptist being girt about in the story of a group who are to be girt about and their lights burning when he returns from the wedding. How did this start? This remnant worker being a type of John the Baptist that we've been revealing forever. We've shown, I don't think we're going to be going into Ephesians chapter 6. We, we shared on a little bit before. Um, I'm not going, like I said, into all of Ephesians tonight. There certainly won't be enough time, but we've shared on this before as well. Stand, therefore, having your, lo your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. See, something we've shared because Ephesians is talking to that remnant worker just as, <laughs> yep, First Peter chapter 1, another incredible piece of scripture we've shared on and will be led into as this continues tonight. Therefore, gird up your loins, the loins of your, of your mind, 
be sober in the hope of the end of grace at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Again, many parts that we'll be talking on. Every one of these relating to only the Luke group. Because they are the witnesses as John the Baptist who are spirit-filled, who will be receiving his light, but who right now have the light that are as 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 portable lamps. It's wild. Wild, wild stuff to see. Let's go to the next light. In the next light, we see, oh no, that was loins. Okay, so we did the loins, gird about, brought us to 1 Peter, and then also we saw how it brought us over here. We saw this part with Mark 4.21. So remember I was saying how in Luke it was that word light, and in some of the other ones we see it as candle. And when I was showing you this in relation to Mark, let's go to Mark chapter 4. You would think, well, what would this have to do with, with Mark's group? Well, remember, the, the remnant workers are working. They're working during the time of seals to bring in the great multitude. Well, listen to what it says about the story. Remember I said there was no light. There was no light except for the word candlestick that has a version of portable lamp. It's pretty wild because the, the Mark group, the, the, the world, that second creation group, the, the same typology of those that were made in his image as light, it would seem that they're only walking around with portable light. Do you know why? Because they're still lost. Jesus needs to come and shine that light in the darkness so that these guys who are the world of church, remember, the one that relates to the Luke group in Luke chapter 12, they're spirit-filled. They're the spirit-filled portion that are remaining to work who have a portable lamp with them. The Mark group, the world, the sleeping church that is going to be part of the great multitude rapture, they're not spirit-filled. <clears throat> Let me prove it. Remember, we shared many times on this. You see, those in Luke cha in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2, I knew a man in Christ. Remember Romans chapter 8? Those who are in Christ, spirit-filled, they're the sons of God, just as John the Baptist. They're, they're the witnesses and so forth. They're the group that goes to the third heaven. That's the pre-trip. But then what does he say? He doesn't say in Christ, as he did the first time, in verse 3, he says, I knew such a man, okay? Which means like, kind of, sort of like the first one, but not really fully in Christ. They're the light group. They're the group that are the same as those beings in the second creation of light when Christ was made light, and they fell, they were corrupted, unbeknownst to them, as Romans 1 tells us. It doesn't mean that that the people in the sleeping church are them today as, as the same spirit of them that were over there. Remember, it's all a fractal. It's all of this replaying, replaying, replaying. But it's not a reincarnation. It's the same spirit of people, the same typology of things playing out, a group that has been deceived and, and been blinded. They, they're the ones that belong to the Lord, but they've been corrupted with these things in the world and by the church. They're the ones who are also walking with candles, but they don't have the Spirit of God in them. The Spirit of God people are being taken out, and a remnant of them with the Spirit of God are remaining. That's why these guys are walking around with portable lamps but there's a group that has to has to give them that light that will light them for christ to be in his image for the mid-trib great multitude rapture so now listen to what this says we're following the story down from after the candle in mark 4 26 and he said 
so is the kingdom of God, as if a man should cast seed into the ground and should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should spring up and grow, he knoweth not how. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, okay? Then the ear, which is what? The head. The head goes first. After that, the what? The full corn. The full corn. What does the word full mean? Complete. Full. The fullness of what? The corn. What is the corn? Wheat. Wheat. Hello. First the head, then the full wheat. But when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he putteth the sickle, putteth in the sickle, because the harvest is come. This is all the fullness of the great multitude rapture in the seventh year of seals. Do you know that this word sickle, which is to pluck, how about that, right? This word sickle, which is to pluck, which is a word for harpazo, is used eight times. And do you know that in all, in fact, let me show it to you. In all the Gospels, do you think it's used in Matthew, Mark, and Luke? Or do you think maybe it's used only in Mark? Ta-da. What, what's the story going on here? It's the story of the great multitude rapture, the sickle being put to the harvest of the fullness of wheat. And it's the story, as we have shared from Revelation 14, 14. Only in Mark's story at the fullness of wheat. I love how that happens. All right, all right, let's see, let's see, where are we? Let's go back into Luke chapter 11. Following this story of light. And I think I had more with this one. Let me go back and make sure the 3088. There it is. The 3088. Because there was, I think there was many connections. Oh, no, that was it. No, that was it. Now, we did the loins. We did the mark. All right, now we're going to get to the next light. As we read in Luke 11.34, after talking about these lights and seeing these connections, it just this is just the beginning. It gets pretty wild. So we're in midway through 11, verse 34, Luke 11.34. Uh, the whole the thy whole body also shall be full of light, full of light, illuminated, comes from Jesus' light. It's used five times. Let's go see where this one shows up. We see it twice in Luke eleven thirty four and thirty six. In fact, we got it three times in Luke. Now, here's one that I don't fully yet have understood. And I'm going to show you why. We see it in Matthew and in Matthew. And one of the places we see it in Matthew is in Matthew 17, verse 5. Now, why would a connection from Luke into Matthew chapter 17 be there when it's connected to verse Five, in related to, behold, the brightness of the cloud. Verse 5 spoke right here. A bright cloud overshadowed. Why on earth does Luke, in his light conversation, <clears throat> have a picture of it at the post-trib return of the Lord in the picture of the transfiguration? I don't really know. <laughs> I'm not overly certain, <coughs> excuse me, why it's there. 
I have two things. One of them I'm not so sure of, and the other one might be because there's going to be the resurrection of what? The resurrection of those who put their necks on the line, who are the Luke ones, who are going to be what? The priests and kings, they're going to be what? Priests reigning with Christ as priests for the millennial reign. Could it be that that's the relation of when he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives? For yet he spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. So this bright cloud overshadowing, could it be those full of light who are being part of the resurrection? Right? The resurrection of the just. That is possible. I'm not fully convinced. I'm not fully certain. But... There wasn't a lot to go on in this one. What is my other option? I think my other option is this shows up at the return of the Lord after six days, which is the after six years of trumpets. My thinking was the possibility of Romans chapter 9. And it's the story right here. Where is it? I think it's 9. Uh, 11. I was thinking it was the possibility of the story right here. When God had said um, in Romans eleven four, 4, but what saith the answer of God unto him in relation to Elijah? I have reserved, okay? <clears throat> I have reserved, I have left behind. Now, this isn't the Mark or Matthew group. This is a specific group that the Lord has reserved to himself. Now, remember, all of these servants are the fathers as well. So there's a group being reserved unto himself that are 7,000 men that will have not have bowed the knee unto the image of Baal. Even so, at this, even so then, at this present time, also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Who are these 7,000? It's something we've shared uh, many of time in Revelation at the end of the sixth trumpet. You see what I'm saying? The end of the sixth trumpet is the 7,000 that the Lord had reserved unto himself, which may appear to be part of the, the, the Luke remnant workers that we've been talking about that he's going to set aside for himself to remain to the end of trumpets. And then they will die, and then they would be part of the resurrection of the just as well. But you'll notice that they die at the end of the sixth year of seals. I mean, at the end of the sixth year of trumpets. So when we go to Matthew 17, and we see where that light is of that cloud that was light, that was light it's when the Lord has already come as at the seventh trumpet. So you see, this one is actually off by hours maybe because we know it says in the same hour. And when we go to Matthew 24, it said immediately after the tribulation of those days. So you have in the same hour, the 7,000 died in that earthquake. The second woe was passed. Uh, um, Matthew 24 says immediately after the tribulation of those days, and it's the picture of the Lord coming. So it might be only an hour, but it really strikes me more so that that light is related to the remnant group that will be returning with the Lord. In fact, that just piqued my interest. In fact, in fact, in fact, when we come to Revelation 19, and we know that the Lord is coming, as the white horse rider, right? He's coming what? When he's returning feet down on the Mount of Olives, it's that final 14th year of judgment against all of the enemies, dipped in blood. Who's he coming with? Uh, where is it? Right here. In Revelation 19, 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And see, that sat on him was called, uh, him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he does judge and make war. On his get of any clothes, do, 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 clothed in white. Does it say who they are? Uh, and his name is called, and his name is forehead. 
Maybe I was thinking of the other one. And the armies which were in heaven, oh, here we go, nine, uh, 1914. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. That Luke group possibility, right? That they're the ones coming with them. That could be them coming in that cloud. Again, like I said, I'm not convinced on this one, but that timing is connected in it. Let's keep going with this light. Luke 11, 35. Let me make sure I'm tracking where I am. All right. All right, all right, all right. Here is the next light. That's right. This one right here. Uh, take light 46. All right. In Luke eleven thirty five, Take heed, therefore, that the light which is in thee be not darkness. Well, lo and behold, did you hear that? The light in the darkness again. The light in the darkness again. So when we look at this light, which light is it? This is Christ Jesus. This is the light of the Lord, not darkness. And he's coming to what? Shine his light in the darkness. So when we see this light, 50, uh, 54, 57, it is Christ Jesus. It's used 70 times. So, of course, there are many, many places we can go into. We see it right here in Luke chapter 2, a light to lighten the Gentiles. And Luke chapter 2 is a prophetic picture of what? The 40 days of the Son of Man who had come. Luke 35, Luke 11, 35 is, of course, the picture of him, the light in the darkness. We can keep going and look at where we see it. John 1, John 1, John 1, John 1, John 1. Because this is what? Jesus, who is the light that shines in the darkness and the darkness comprehended it not over and over and over it's all connected to christ it's all connected to his light and you can see it again right here showing us that this one is the light of christ now we keep going verse 36 if thy whole body therefore be full of light it's this one over here from before. Having no part dark, the whole shall be full of light. Again, same one again. Remember, it showed up three times, once here, twice here, and the other two were in Matthew. As when the bright shining of a candle doth give thee light. Look at this one. This is the light that is to make see. You can you can track the whole storyline of of the remnant group receiving their light and these portions of time that they're working, what they're going to be doing with it. Let's go see. Doth give thee light. <clears throat> and it's light that is to help make see and this light again of course comes from Christ. Let's see where this is used 11 times. Let me see. Is this the one? Yes, 11 times. Lo and behold, only found in Luke. That's always so telling for us, isn't it? Only found this final light in this conversation that is only found in Luke, connected to the Son of Man coming for 40 days, which is to shed his light, shine his light in the darkness to give it to those who are of the spirit, witnesses as John, like the spirit group of creation, who are his end days witnesses. He's going to give that light to them that they might be able to help others make see. Only found in Luke. Only found in Luke in relation to the Synoptic Gospels. Look where else it's found. John 1, verse 9. That was the true light, 
which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Crazy. It's Jesus giving that light. Look at where it leads us. Ephesians chapter 1 and Ephesians chapter 3. Let's go have a look at Ephesians chapter 1. And we'll go down, we'll start in verse 18. And then we'll see where Ephesians leads us as we go back to see the context around Ephesians. Let's start, uh, let's go to Ephesians 1 verse 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and and revelation in the knowledge of him. Hello. Does everybody have the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Christ? I think a lot of people like to think they do. John, Paul isn't talking to everybody here. Yes, there is an application. We know living in the is that there is a global application to those that are in Christ. But just as the conversation is happening here within Scripture, <coughs> he's speaking to a specific group. And it relates to the is to come remnant workers as it related to the workers in his day. Verse 18, the eyes, see how it was connected? See, it was connected, same as Luke, uh, Luke 11. If your eye be whole, right? The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. The eyes of your understanding, well, wait a second. This again brings us back to Luke chapter 24, this same remnant worker group. Remember what he did unto them? He opened up the understanding of the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms of these things concerning him. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. You don't have that conversation in Mark or in Matthew. And what does it say next? The eyes of your, uh, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, made to see that you may know what is the hope of his calling. That you would know the hope of his calling. And what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. It's, it's constant. It goes through this, guys, over and over and over. It continuously leads us to the revelations within all of these words leading to a remnant worker, a remnant worker, a remnant worker, a remnant worker. It's so much of Scripture. It, it's, it's crazy when you see how much it really is. It's just continued and continuing and continuing. Look at this word also found in Ephesians. Okay? In Ephesians and, lo and behold, only in Luke 2. In Luke chapter 2, verse 15, it says, And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go, un go unto Bethlehem and see this thing, <coughs> excuse me, which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. You guys know what that prophetic understanding is, right? It's the coming of the 40 days of the Son of Man and a group that were foretold that he was returning from the wedding. That's the exact typology. That's the exact prophetic implication of what's being said. And of course, it's connected into Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 3. Let's see what it says in Ephesians 1 verse 9. So we'll back it up a bit. We'll start in verse 7. In whom we have redemption, in whom we have redemption, 
Let's see, full ransom, deliverance. I was going to say, let's, let, let's just see this one. Let's just see if this one is even connected. I think I know this word. In fact, I may already have it. Okay, let me go back over here. Let me bring this one up. Let's just see. I think this is the one that's only found in Luke. <laughs> you're seeing, you're seeing a, a, a pattern, aren't you? Lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. When you track this, you see, Ephesians 1, 7, 1, 14, it's filled with Ephesians again. And the reason is this Ephesians, this redemption being spoken about, as I've said before, in relation to Luke chapter 21. This redemption in relation to the prophetic which is what Luke 21 is. It's part of that 50 days. We know that this right here, I have, I have recently said, it's been a while though, that this coming of the Son of Man in relation to Luke 21, 25, isn't pre-trib. I don't believe it's pre-trib anymore. I've bounced between pre-trib and when he returns for 40 days. I believe this is his coming for 40 days. Because he's not coming. He's not coming to take out the pre-trib bride. The pre-trib bride is down here. They're going to be accounted worthy, boom, to escape all these things. This redemption drawing nigh <coughs> is for the remnant workers. This entire story that we've been talking about, this group of remaining workers who will see this stuff coming, they're the ones whose redemption is drawing nigh in the prophetic understanding of it. If we go back into Ephesians chapter 1, we see it in the entirety of this conversation. Ephesians 1, 7, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Having made known unto us, having made known to give, to understand, that's that word we were looking at right here, to make known, this, this knowing, this understanding, which is only found in Luke chapter 2, verse 15, which is all about that prophetic typology of those shepherds, which are the ones who are with the Lord for 40 days, who are the Smyrna, Luke 24, so on and so forth. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will. Now, it, is there any way when looking at this, that we could say, oh, this is everybody in the church? Oh, of course, the redemption through his blood? Absolutely. It's Of course there's an is application <coughs> to everybody. But is all of this speaking to everybody accounted in the pre-trip? Or do you think this is speaking to a remnant group? A group for which he will have made known unto us the mystery of his will? According to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. Does everybody you know in Christ have understanding, given wisdom and prudence and understanding of the mystery in his will? <laughs> Not that I've known. There's a group being prepared that are being revealed his mystery. And what do we know when the Lord comes? He completes the understanding. It's right there for us in Luke. Verse 10. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, I might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on the earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance 
Look at that one being used one time. In which we have received an inheritance being predestinated. Predestinated. Is everybody <clears throat> predestinated? No, we know that's not true. Not everybody's predestinated. Who are, pre who are those predestinated? Those who are called according to his will. Right? That's what we're told. There it is in Ephesians, twice in Ephesians, <clears throat> and of course, there in Romans. I think I've got this already up here somewhere. There it is. So we can see it even in the word mystery. The mysteries, Ephesians, Ephesians. We see it back in Romans. Look at what we're seeing here. A group predestined, a group in, in the mysteries that have been made known by the Lord. We go to the word mystery, the things that have been secret. When we track that one, we see it also in Romans 16. Okay? When we go to Romans 16, verse 25, you guys will know this one. Something else we've taught on over the years. We know there's the remnant worker group, the Aquilas and Priscillas, those that will put their necks on the line for the churches of the Gentiles, which is a picture of the workers during seals who will put their necks on the line, who will take part in the resurrection, having done this for the churches of the Gentiles. And then you've got the picture of the pre-trib in the doxology in Romans 16, verse 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. In in uh, Paul's time, he's talking, of course, about the revelation of Jesus Christ. In the is to come, the wording is revealing to us that it's the end of days and the revelation of Christ Jesus with the pre-trib and the mystery of it, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. What is this obedience of faith? That's the pre-trib group having vanished. The mystery of the revelation of Jesus Christ kept secret since the world began, being made known to all nations, revealed from the scriptures of the prophets for the obedience of faith, who is all them who have vanished. And where do we see it? Also in Ephesians. Ephesians, again, let's go back to Ephesians. Whoops, where am I? Chapter 1. And we saw it right there in Ephesians 1.9. And then we see in 1.11, in whom also we have been, uh, we have obtained an inheritance, an allotment, being predestinated. Again, this word being used six times. A, a specific portion of people having been predestinated. And look where you see it. We'll find it twice in Ephesians 1.5. And we're going to find it in Romans chapter 8, verse 29 and 30. What do we know? What do we know about these things in Romans chapter 8? All of it, right? Those who are the sp from the Spirit of God, who are the sons of God, being led by the Spirit, they're the adoption, where they are children of, of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, who is the Father, and joint heirs with Christ, God the Son, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may also that we may be also glorified together? Why, as I've said a number of times, why does this group get to be exalted as joint heirs with Christ? That just doesn't seem right. You know what I'm saying? Why would anyone get to, 
get to be exalted, get to be glorified with Christ. To be a co-heir, a joint heir with Christ, it seems absurd every time I read it. How is it possible? Do you know why? Because this group are a part of the spirit group as Christ in his first creation portion. Those who were spirit filled as the John the Baptist who are going to what? Do as Christ did when he was here the first time. In the fulfillment from the was, Jesus came in the is as light. You following? He came in the is as light. And do you know he, who he came for? He came to shed his light in the darkness, right? Do you know what Jesus said? I came not, well, we already know, right? I came not but for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But do you know what else he says? We're going to touch on this in a little bit. He says, I came not for them who were already whole. What? I have not come for them who have already been made whole. For them who are already sound. You know what that's telling us? Just like I was saying in Luke 21, that when the Lord is coming at the 40 days, the pre-trib is gone. He doesn't need to come for those who are already sound in the Lord. He's coming as he did back then to shine his light, to shed his light on those who are lost, on, on those who were the equivalent of this creation of his of light that they were a part of in the same typology and in the is to come. It's to receive the, the, those who are needing the light of the Lord. They weren't spirit-filled, but they're his portion, <coughs> excuse me, in relation to light. So, if Christ came and Christ was the light and he's going to impart his light on the co-heirs who are spirit filled in Christ, the remnant group remaining. They're going out to what? Spread the light of Christ that is now filled in them in the end of days. To do what? The same thing Christ did when he came the first time. To wake up the people to the truth of the Lord. This group is going to be filled with the literal light of Christ. With his understanding. It says with wisdom and knowledge. With the mysteries of the secret. Since the beginning of creation. They're going to do. The Lord's work in his will as volunteer soldiers for the Lord. And what's their reward going to be? Their reward is to be co-heirs with Christ. If they suffer with them, which they will do during seals, putting their necks on the line, and they will get to be glorified together. Well, that sounds absolutely ludicrous. <laughs> I agree, man. To be joint heir, glorified together with Christ, sounds sounds in, an impossibility. But it's the reward for serving the Lord for his people. And look what happens. Remember at the end of the Laodicean age, in the is to come, when the 14 years in the final at the end of time, at the end of tribulation, we shared in recent videos, I think even in the last one. What does he say at the end of Revelation 3.21? Uh, to him that overcometh, I will grant to sit with me in my throne. Even as I also overcame. So what's he got? A group that overcame, that will sit with him in his throne, even as he overcame. Having put himself Right? Willingly put himself, allowed, allowed himself to be put to death as the remnant worker who will be putting their necks on the line, going to death for the Lord to help bring in the great multitude rapture. Remember what happens <clears throat> unless a seed falls to the ground? It won't, it won't bring up as much, will it? 
If a seed falls to the ground, much more will be brought up. That's what's going to happen to the remnant workers. That's why that story is connected in John chapter 4 to the remnant groupers when he's, uh, workers when he says, you guys are saying four months. I'm saying it's four months early. He's talking about the difference from one wheat harvest to the other wheat harvest. And then he goes on to say, look, you know, unless a, a seed falls to the ground, it's not going to bring in a whole bunch of new fruit. Because this group is going to overcome as he overcame. And their overcoming is what? To be glorified as he was glorified. And they will what? Get to sit in his throne with him? <laughs> that still blows my mind. I still can't get over it. And as I end and sat down with my father in his throne. That's what's coming. For the remnant workers. He's not going to have two billion people sitting on his throne with him. There's not going to be a billion, two billion people resurrected in Christ that were that in Christ and just uh, the light group sends Christ till the end and everybody being resurrected. So there'll be two billion people as priests and kings ruling over like maybe 500 million people left. No. It's a remnant group that work to serve the Lord. That's what we're seeing. Let me make sure I'm back in the right spot. Eight. Eight. Romans eight. So we know that this, this context of all of this talk being talked about here is to this remnant group and the work that they're going to do, how that, that next group, the creature group, which is the light group, or the, the, there's this earnest expectation right we've shared on this this is wild it tells you right here in verse 19 for the earnest expectation of the creature which is the light group which are those during the that will be part of the great multitude rapture they're waiting for the manifestation of the sons of god they're waiting for the pre-trib and this remnant group of workers i don't think they literally know it but those spirits in them probably recognize it or will recognize it because remember what happens later remember what's going to happen it's going to be chaos and people are going to realize that they missed something those who are part of the church they will be upset with their pastors that they never prepared them they never taught them the truth now let's go down to verse 28 through 30 where we saw this conversation we were talking about actually in 29. We're following this same from Ephesians still. And Romans 8, 29, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate, listen to this, listen to this, for whom he did foreknow. Okay? This foreknowing we know is connected to the beginning of creation. That that whole one wonder group, like the John the Baptist, the spirit group, the, the sons of God, spirit of God. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate, there it is again, now listen to this, to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Did you catch it? I was, I was touching on it earlier. So a group in the spirit who, who he did foreknow as John the Baptist, what did he do? They were, he predestinated them. Nobody knows with certainty that they are this predestinate group in the is-to-come workers except there is revelation being revealed that seems to be preparing some people. What's going to happen to them? They're going to be conformed, fashioned like unto his what? His image. If they are, listen how deep this goes. If there is a remnant group who were part of the spirit group as John the Baptist, which we know there are. And when he's coming as light, 
when he returns for his 40 days to shine his light in the darkness. And it's a prophetic picture of what was in creation when God the Father made Christ then light. And from that light, Christ made males and females in his image, which was light. What, pray tell, image do you think this entire conversation of remnant workers, sons of God, co-heirs with Christ who will suffer as he did to be glorified together with them who are going to be working during the time of seals, which is a prophetic type in the in the was as working over the light group, who are now currently as if holding portable candles. What are they going to be made into? They're going to be confirmed and conformed into his image. They're going to be conformed into his image, which was what? Light. Do you see how this all connects? It follows the entirety of the storyline. The entirety of the is to come storyline. Those who are part of the sons of God, the John the Baptist, the witnesses of Christ, when he came as light, will in the is to come, come for 40 days to shed his light on those that he lighted, which is the candle of Smyrna, who will suffer as he did to be glorified with him, to give this great light of his into them to be conformed after his image to wake up those who are waiting for the pre-trib group to be taken out whether they're aware or not, in spirit, that the manifestation of the sons of God happen so that the Lord may then give to those who he foreknew, predestinated, that he might conform them to his image, which was light. Verse 30, Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also, you guessed it, called and whom he called them he also justified and whom he justified them he also glorified this is a remnant group in the prophetic end of days who will be conformed to his image it's crazy depth going in to this revelation of these remnant workers. That was just from a, a couple little blurbs, just connected to Ephesians. May know from the mystery, the inheritance, the predestinated. Verse 13. Ephesians 1, verse 13. In whom you also trusted that after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation... Let's see if I've got that one. 4991. Oh, I do. Oh, look at this. Luke 1, Luke 1, Luke 1, Luke 19. All right, we are going to have some fun here. You see, what are we what are we understanding in this? Remember, we're looking through it through the prophetic end time eyes of the open books in all of the revelation over the years. This, this preparing of a remnant group that is really built over the last four years or so. This, this entirety, again, I'm telling you, this entirety of this conversation is about this group, this predestinated, who have this inheritance for them coming, who we justified and will glorify. It's saying when they finally hear this, because remember, they're going to be in the presence of the Lord to receive it. This salvation, it says, uh, the gospel of salvation, in whom also, after that you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. This word for salvation, 
is only used in the Gospels, in the Synoptic Gospels, when we talk about Gospels, in Luke chapter 1, 69 through 77. Let's go check, a, let's go check that. 69, Luke 1, 69 through 77. Look at the conversation. For those of that have been around for a while, for those that don't know, you can go watch a video called, um, I think it's called Luke in Order. I think there's four hands in the image, and one is holding a finger one, one is holding a finger two, finger three, and finger four. Because there's a prophetic revelation in the book of Luke which relates to the first four chapters. Chapter one is the pre-trib taking of the bride of Christ. It's his return then for 40 days in chapter two. It's his return at the end of six years of seals in chapter three. And it's his return feet down on the Mount of Olives in chapter four, prophetically woven through Luke one, two, three, and four within the words that had taken place from the is. It's wild. If you're brand new, it's it's going to be a lot. That's why I always recommend with every video, you start with the intro series. Look at starting in verse 68. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of, there it is, salvation for us, in the house of his servant David, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, there's that, again, spoken by the prophets of old, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us. Who's he talking to? Does it sound like he's talking to a group of people being protected, almost like John's? Like like John the Baptist types? Pretty funny considering John, Luke chapter 1 is the story of the birth of John the Baptist and his circumcising redemption on the eighth day to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he, had, which he swore to our father Abraham that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear. Same context. In holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And thou, child, shall be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation, unto his people by the remission of their sins. Who's he talking to? It's Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist on the eighth day at the circumcision, which is prophetically in the end time revelation, which is what? When the Lord returns on the eighth day after the wedding. Remember what happens? Luke chapter 12, he tells the remnant workers to be ready when he returns. They're going to serve him voluntarily as his soldiers. The pre-trib group is going to happen. There's going to be the seven-day wedding in heaven, and the Lord's going to return on the eighth day. John's circumcision on the eighth day. The Luke 21 redemption of this group on the eighth day as John the Baptist who I've been relating to since the beginning, are what? The prophetic picture of the end days remnant workers. All throughout Luke chapter 1. Do you think that was by chance too? Are we going to chalk that one up and say, well, maybe that was just a lucky one? Just in case you think maybe it was luck. I know you guys don't think that. We couldn't have been doing this for six and a half years if it was just nothingness equaling nothingness every time. Hundreds upon hundreds of revelations, week after week after week after week after week, never stopping. All proving out the same context in every case. The revelation of the end of days. How about we go look 
at Luke chapter 19, verse 9. Or let's just look at all of 19. Remember, we were in 19 a little earlier, and I said, if I remember when we get to that, <clears throat> excuse me, we'll go into it again. So here it is right here. In Luke 19, verse 9, what you're about to see here is the exact same prophetic picture in the end of days that is built in to the story. It is weaved in. The prophecy of the end of days is weaved in throughout chapter 19 of Luke. Watch this. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for as much as he also is a son of Abraham, for the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. This is a picture of the Lord coming. This is a, a typology of him coming at the beginning of those 50 days. Watch what happens. You get the parable of the minas. We know what happens in the end of days when this begins. This group is being told they're being prepared by the Lord to wait when he returns from the wedding. The pre-trib group vanishes. They're taken to the seven, the wedding that's going to take place. When they're taken, what do we know happens next? The Lord is going to return the same day at evening. Remember, he's going to come the same day at evening, John tells us in chapter 20. He's going to breathe and anoint the new modern day apostles. And during those Seven days, the first group of the group we've been talking about all night, this remnant worker group, they're going to be kept. They're going to be waiting for the Lord's return. But the modern day apostles, they're going to be breathed on, whoever they might be, and they're going to have work to do during that week while the wedding's taking place before the Lord returns on the eighth day. And I've related it and shown it that this parable of the ten minas is a picture of what they're doing during that week. Just as we showed that in Matthew, when you see the picture of the, what is it, the coins or, or the money or whatever it's called, or talents over in Matthew 25, there's a picture of a group of people that are working during the wedding week. Because there are two weddings. There's the Gentile wedding at the beginning and there's the Jewish wedding at the end. And it's the same picture. It is the one at the end of the 14 years in Matthew 25. And they have this money and they're to go out and to do certain things. You're seeing the exact same thing happen in Matthew in Luke 19 here. This parable of the 10 minas. And what is happening in this, see the 10 servants. It's the same picture. There's going to be something, a, a work, something that the apostles are going to be doing that are a picture of what's happening here in this story of the parable of the ten minas during the seven-day wedding in heaven. When the Lord returns from the wedding, we know that he is going to briefly meet with them. Just like John chapter 20 showed. When he returns again after eight days, the first thing he does is he's going to go and meet with those apostles that he breathed on. And how many did he breathe on? Ten. Because Thomas wasn't there. Thomas missed it. And Judas had already killed himself. So there were only ten, as you see ten here. And what happens? He's going to meet with them briefly. Then we end up seeing that uh, uh, um, in John, we see that Thomas is there. And then from John chapter 20, it goes to Luke 24. And Luke 24 is the picture, same as that eighth day when he meets with the apostles, that, that same eighth day. He's going to meet with the apostles, and then he's going to make his way in as the beginning of the 40 days, the picture of his triumphal entry. When he does, look at that. There's those two disciple types. Hello. They're the Luke 24 guys. They're, they're the, the John the Baptist, the Elijah type and Moses type from John the Baptist. 
It's the picture of the triumphal entry. We've broken down the triumphal entry of Luke, Mark, and Matthew in a pre, mid, and post. In fact, in one of the videos, you'll see the conversation, um, how the triumphal entry, the transfiguration, and the resurrection in Luke, Mark, Matthew are all a, a prophetic typology of the Lord coming for 40 days um, after the wedding in the in the above 50, then him coming at the end of six years of seals, then his coming at the end of six years of trumpets. It's it's incredible when you see these differences. And so many of you that have been around for a while know this about the triumphal entry, and we've got a breakdown of these some of these differences within the triumphal entry, and it's awesome. So much clarity is brought to the story. But now what happens? What happens? <clears throat> okay, we're, we're connecting this to what we were seeing. How not only was it a picture of this 40 days type or that, that beginning of the 50 and him being there or, or that eighth day at John's birth or at the, the eighth day at his circumcision. What are we seeing now? Here he is coming for his 40 days. They've started. And what does he do? He goes and weeps over Jerusalem and he's warning them that they're about to be compassed about and then destroyed, laid even with the ground, even the children that are with them because they knew not the time of their visitation. There's a reason why this story is only in Luke and not in Mark and not in Matthew. Same with the story of the light that we've been talking about. This story right here is precisely what he's doing as he comes in Luke 11 as Jonah for 40 days. And it's precisely the story that we read right here, starting in Luke 21, verse 12. But before all these, it relates to him coming as the son of man when he's coming to begin his 40 days. And when he comes, what is he going to do? warn them that they're about to be compassed by armies and be destroyed that they should all flee to the mountains don't let anybody new come in because this is the beginning of the days of vengeance and wrath upon this people they'll be led away captive trodden down to the gentiles until the times of the gentiles be fulfilled the end of seals all of it is related to the pre-remnant group and the coming 40 days of the Son of Man. Over and over and over again. Of course, it was from Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. I was telling our brother Jake the other day, just go, go take a read through the book of Ephesians, even just chapter 1 as we've been doing here tonight. And see all of this connection to the wording connected to this remnant group. That was just a verse 13. Verse 14. Which is the earnest. Okay. This group from the salvation. <coughs> which were sealed with that of the Holy Spirit of promise. Which is the earnest. The pledged money for our inheritance. Until the redemption we covered that as well of the purchased possession until this particular possession is acquired here is that one that redemption that we were showing from luke 21 that we just saw in seven in uh, ephesians 1 7 and 1 14 now this one this possession this purchased possession and where does it come where does it lead us to it leads us to first peter chapter 2 look at this word for this purchased possession okay again first peter <clears throat> i'm not gonna recap everything in first peter because first peter is that same conversation we've been having and we've covered this right a group of people who have an inheritance incorruptible, doesn't fade away, undefiled, reserved for them in heaven, who are kept by the power of God 
through faith unto, oh, wouldn't you imagine? There it is too. Unto salvation. Which means, if we go back into this, I didn't even keep going to the rest of the places. 1 Peter 1, 1 Peter 1, 1 Peter 1. See what's happening? This same group that we were talking about, this salvation group, who are the ones chosen, the predestinated inheritance, incorruptible, like John the Baptist from John 1, only found in Luke, in the Synoptic Gospels, are those who are kept unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the end of days. Craziness. <laughs> I love it. I absolutely love it. It's it's beyond crazy. Verse 9, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. How could somebody receive the end of their faith and the salvation of their souls and they're still walking around alive? Because they've been in the witness, in the presence of Jesus Christ, which is the appearing of Christ, used 18 times and is only used once in all the book of Revelation. And it's the picture when John the Revelator in, Gen in Revelation chapter 1, when he's before the Lord. It's the same typology, the same group that will be this same group. Searching what or what manner testify beforehand. <clears throat> I mean, like I said, I don't want to go into every part of First Peter because we have done that. We, we have broken it down so much. So let's go back to verse 9. We're going to go to... 1 Peter 2, verse 9. In fact, <laughs> now we got to start in verse 4. <laughs> but I'll stop when we get to verse 9 so you see what we're getting at. To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, ye also as living stones. Wasn't this entire conversation that we would be as Christ in the sense that we would be receiving his light? We would be sitting in his throne, right? The remnant workers will sit in his throne, having put their necks on the line. As Roman eight, Romans 8, as the co-heirs to be glorified together with them, seeing that they will sit in his throne with him as co-heirs. Isn't it only fitting that Christ who is the living stone, we're being told that the remnant group will also be living stones? Do you see what I'm saying? <laughs> it's, it gets so, <clears throat> it gets so deep. It is so spiritually and eventually physically hard to fathom in our little minds to, to comprehend even though I'm reading this and I've studied it out and, and I've understood it and I think, ah, oh. it, it almost makes your head want to explode. It's, it, it, it's not possible. And when you compile, if you compile it with the understanding that in the end of days, it's going to be a time worse than it ever was in all of human history, which means the power given and the authority in all of this is going to be way more than anything given before to a remnant group, to a, a people chosen to work in their season and times, in the was and in the is. That this group in the end of days is going to be so overwhelmingly empowered in Christ Jesus that they're like a bunch of little Jesuses. Now, I am not saying we're gods. I am not saying we're Christ. Please acknowledge that. Please be aware of that. <clears throat> I'm showing you that scriptures is telling us that this group will be as lively stones as Christ is a living stone. It's telling us that we will receive the light as Christ was the light. It's telling us that we'll sit on his throne with him as he sits in his throne with his father. I'm not saying it. I'm reading it. And who have we known these people to be in all of these teachings that we've done? Well, here's the answer. 1 Peter 2, verse 5. 
you also as living stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. Do you think this is any priesthood? A priestly fraternity? Absolutely, it's a specific one. Because this priestly fraternity is only used twice. And where do you think the other one's used? You got it. Where we're going to get to, 1 Peter 2, verse 9. What is this priestly fraternity? <clears throat> See? Where it's used one times to be a priest. This priestly fraternity to be a priest, which is precisely what? What, the, what? what does the end of days tell us? What does it tell us about those who have part in the resurrection? That they are priests who will reign with him for the millennial reign. Reigning with him, which is the end of the Laodicean age of the is to come, when he will sit in his father's throne with his father, while the priestly line who are reigning with him are sitting in his throne with him. Hello. A holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore, also, it is contained in the scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. So what do you think they're going to do with the remnant workers, with this priestly remnant working line, <coughs> which we know are Gentiles? In fact, depending on how much further I'm going to go, you'll, you'll see it's all about Gentiles. In fact, I got a little bit more. We will be able to touch on it. What do you think they're going to do with us or whoever the workers will be? They're going to reject them too. Who were the builders? They were the ones there with Christ in the portion of light. We are the ones as Christ, as his chosen called remnant servants in the time of light, which is the time of seals. And we're going to be what? Disallowed, beaten, and killed. Because we're what? Living stones as Christ is the living stone. You see how it all connects? Verse 8. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. Look at that. Stumbling at the word? Being disobedient? That means somebody who's reading the word. Yet being disobedient. Because they're stumbling at it. And most people allow those who haven't had understanding, like so much that has just gone astray in the church. But apparently, it's the portion they were appointed to. Which, when you understand Luke, Mark, Matthew, spirit, light, flesh, creation of spirit, creation of light, and then the flesh in Genesis chapter 2, you can understand why there is an appointment an appointed portion of group for those people. Now to verse 9. But you are a chosen generation. Look at this. A royal priesthood. A royal, kingly, kingly, royal priesthood. And what are they called in the end of days? In those who get part in the first resurrection which is the Smyrna group, the Luke group, the John types, those putting their necks on the line, the, the, the Priscilla's and Aquila's putting their necks on the line for the churches of the Gentiles. All right? They're a royal priesthood. They're the ones who will be reigning with him as priests. A royal priesthood. A holy nation, a peculiar, look at this, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you da, 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 out of the darkness 
into his marvelous light. That's why it's the topic of today's conversation, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God. What? But in time past were not of people? Look at what it goes on to say. Uh, in which obtained mercy, but now, uh, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims. Abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles. All of this in what? Remember this time of visitation? This group being prepared, this group being readied? But what were they called? In time past, they were not a people. But now they're the people of God. Chosen by him to receive his light, a royal priesthood. Well, do you understand that if this royal priesthood is from a group of people that were not his people, but are now the people of God, that means they have to be Gentiles? Want me to prove it to you? Romans 11. Romans chapter 11. We see the, right, the, the uh, grafted in, which is all about the story of the Gentiles. Watch this. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Is it 9? I thought it was 11. Did I skip down too fast? Must be 9. Romans chapter 9. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Here we go. Uh, let's start in verse 23. And that he might make known to give understanding. See, to make known, to give, uh, give to understand which I think was uh, another piece we might have had back here. Right here, right? We were talking about this being in Ephesians 1.9. This to make known of the mystery, right? This making known of the mystery, which we showed was also connected to, um, to the end of Romans 16, which is that remnant group that comes out from that mystery. Well, what do we know happens? We see this make known is here. So it's that same connection to the same group. The riches of his glory on the vessels. Ready for this? Specifically, a wife as contributing to the usefulness of her husband. Contributing to the usefulness of her husband. Remember, remember John chapter 8? That woman, that, that adulterous woman, which is a typology of a Gentile woman. Which, remember, we the, the, it's a remnant bride. It is a remnant bride remaining. This vessel, specifically a, a, a wife who is contributing to the usefulness of her husband. That's being given this, is being made known to the riches of his glory, of mercy, which he had afore prepared <laughs> unto glory. This afore prepared again. This group prepared in advance. 4282. Let me see. I think I've got that one here. Maybe not. 4282. Let's see what that one says. G42. <clears throat> Oops. G4282. Romans 9 and Ephesians chapter two huh ephesians again funny how that works right not really <laughs> it gets obvious after a while verse 24 romans 9 verse 24 even us whom he hath called not of the jews only but also of the gentiles as he saith in osi which is hosea okay from the book of hosea written to the gentiles right i will call them my people which were not my people and her beloved which was not my beloved you see that just what we were talking about in first peter the same wording when we go back to first peter chapter 9 who is who are the ones who were not his people but are now his people 
It's the Gentiles. So who are the ones being called? Who are the ones who are his royal priesthood? Called out of darkness into his marvelous light, who were not a people but are now a people. It's the Gentiles. That's the story of what's going on here. Let's see where this takes us. 17. Let's go back into Ephesians. We're bringing it to an end. Ephesians 1. <clears throat> so again, see? All from this purchased possession. Let's go into 17. Oh, this gets really good. So... Ephesians 1, 17 and 18. And I'll start, it'll really truly be winding down here. Uh, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, <coughs> excuse me, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. See, does, does anybody get that? No, remember we were talking about this earlier. This enlightened. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling. Okay, this group being called, this invitation. And what do we know this connects us to? It connects us to the revelation of Jesus Christ. This portion of revelation, let me just find where I'm at, which is, again, 1 Peter 1, 7. Remember this? When I said I didn't want to go too far down the story of of first Peter again, because we've covered it a lot. This is to show you that this revelation right here, this appearing of Christ, this coming of Christ is related to Genesis. Uh, sorry, to Revelation chapter one, that this group who is being kept reserved into an inheritance, all of this stuff that we've covered. That they're going to be what that they're going to have received the end of of their faith and the salvation of their souls because they will have what well verse 7 that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes though it be tried with fire might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of christ jesus this is how they receive the end of their faith this is the appearing of Christ Jesus in the prophetic picture of John the Revelator in, Gen in Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. Remember what it said? We shared it just in a recent video. This word for appearing, G602, is only used once in all the book of Revelation, and it's used right here. And what is it about? It is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants. Things which must shortly come to pass. Prophecy being revealed. It, it connects to all of this stuff. This group clearly being prepared. So when we come now, as we were seeing over here, in the connection to for uh, Ephesians chapter 3 as well. So we see this, like I said, I didn't want to go into a lot of Ephesians, but there's way more than just chapter one. Go read the whole book of Ephesians. Look at this. The mystery of the gospel revealed. <laughs> right off the bat, right? What? For you Gentiles. Verse three. How that by revelation, there it is. He made known unto me the mystery. There's that mystery again we were talking about. Um, as I wrote, as I wrote a four in few words, listen to this. Listen to how powerful this is for us. Whereby, when you read, when you read, you may understand. You may understand, comprehend, perceive my knowledge. In the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets. How? By the Spirit. The one-oneers. 
that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs, should be fellow heirs, co-heirs, and of the same body, partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Verse 8. Oh, this gets really wild. Verse 8. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see. Remember this, to make see? Hello. Remember this make see was the final see in the in the lights of Luke 11. It was the last one about when I was saying pay attention as we go through this group that is going to be made to see given the understanding because they're going to be what the ones working during the time of the Gentiles, but they're Gentiles themselves. What is the fellowship to uh, um and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Christ Jesus. That's what we were talking about earlier, right? I came into this and said I would wrap it around back to here. Well, listen to what he says. That I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches it says unsearchable. How could, he, how could he preach unsearchable things? Things that are a mystery never before known since what? The beginning of the world. What? Showing things unsearchable, hidden since the beginning of creation? That are past finding out? Well, look what happens when we go back into Romans. Chapter 11, these unsearchable things, right? In Romans 11, you see where we were? We're going to continue from that group. Verse 32, for God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. Verse 33, oh, the depth of the riches of both of wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable, look at this one. This one's only used one time. How unsearchable are his judgments. What are judgments, guys? Right? About the end of days? And his ways past finding out. This is the past finding out that we were just seeing in Ephesians chapter 3. This untraceable, unsearchable past finding out. Then how did Paul know? Well, what did Ephesians tell us? Ephesians told us that he got it by what? By the Spirit. It is a Spirit leading, guys. It is a Spirit leading prepared group of people among the Gentiles who will go out to the Gentiles of the world with the unsearchable revelation of the riches in Christ Jesus to help make all men see the mystery of Christ Jesus that had been hid since the creation of the world of things that have been created by Christ for the Father since the world began, and the prophetic end of days understanding of this is the is to come revelation that is being made known now. That when the Lord comes, will make known the final revelation of it because they are the unsearchable mysteries. And what does it start with? With this unsearchable mystery since the beginning of creation. Romans 16 told us this unsearchable mystery from the beginning of creation, which was in the time of Paul, Christ, which is in the end of days, the pre-trib, pre-trib Gentile bride of Christ, 
and the group kept secret, prepared for the time of the end, who will receive the light of the Lord Jesus Christ, who will be as little stones as Christ is the stone, who will be given the mystery of the knowledge and understanding by the Spirit as co-heirs with Christ to go out and preach the ways and the mysteries of the revelation of Jesus Christ in the end of days. Brothers and sisters, I hope you could track that. I hope it was, <laughs> I mean, I could keep going. I could probably keep teaching on this for another three hours. In fact, I was hoping to get to Titus. Could you imagine? It even keeps going. It keeps going into some craziness with Titus. In fact, I don't want to leave it just like this because there was one more piece that I said I wanted to bring about. And just as this sound doctrine, okay, this sound doctrine, let's go to Luke 531. In Luke chapter 5, you're going to find out this story is in all of the Gospels as well. Okay? This calling of Levi, right? Uh, where is it? Do, 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 do. In verse in Luke 5, 31 and 32. And Jesus answering said unto them that they that are whole... Remember I was telling you guys this earlier? I'm glad I remembered. I didn't want to forget this. Answering that they that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. You see that? Which means there were righteous people. He's not coming for them. Jesus doesn't come to save the people that are saved. He's coming to save the lost, the sinners. But look at this. Do you know that this is only found in Luke? Let me show you. If I look up uh, Levi, I'm looking up Levi for a reason. So 3018, because I can't recall where it was in Luke. So let me go to G3018 <clears throat> to bring up Levi so I can find the story in Mark. Oh, shoot, I can't find it in Matthew. I think Matthew's in chapter 3. Um, because this story, I want you to see this. They that are whole. Let me type that in. They that are whole. There's Mark's. Oh, it doesn't have Matthew's again. Okay, that's okay. But there's a reason I want you guys to see this. They that are whole. Look at this word. To be uncorrupt, true in doctrine. Of course, it can relate to body and a healthy body. But only Luke's relates to the truth of doctrine remember how we said that those from mark's group and those from matthew's group the word tells us that they err they err not knowing the scriptures and here we find in this story about this calling of of levi or matthew to him we see this story that i'm not calling those who are whole those who are of a true sound doctrine He's calling those who are lost. Listen to what happens. Mark, it said in chapter 2, right? Check this out. Mark chapter 2, the calling of Levi. Mark 2, verse 17. When Jesus heard it, he said unto them, They that are whole have no need of physician. But look at what the word is. Remember we were talking about this differences in the Gospels? Luke's are those of the true doctrine because they study. They seek and search them out diligently. What does it say about the Mark group? Listen to this. Be able, could, might. Isn't that crazy? You find the same thing, I believe, with Matthew. Oh, I don't remember where it is in Matthew. Maybe I can find it from this word. It's, it's not them of a sound doctrine. That's what's missing. The Luke group are those of the sound doctrine. Jesus, when he comes for his 40 days, it has nothing to do with the pre-trib group. They're already gone. Uh, Matthew. 
Here we go, Matthew 9. Let's go to Matthew 9. In fact, you just saw it, okay? Watch this. In Matthew 9, they that be whole. Same one. Because the Mark group and the Matthew group, the reason they are left behind to go through seals and trumpets and their portions of times, their portion and their tribulation, is because they erred not knowing the scriptures. And so when Luke, in Luke's portion, when he says he's not coming for those who are whole, obviously he's not coming for those who are whole. They're already gone pre-trib. But what do we know about those that are whole who are remaining? He has a group who have grown up or have been revealed, have understanding of true doctrine. They, they are sound in their teachings. And when you go to Titus, this is what we find. Let me back this up to Titus. Oh, that was the other one. We see it in Titus. Where is it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I didn't want to go too, too far down that. But in Titus chapter 1, chapter 2, and I want to show you this. We're going to go, we'll go into chapter 2. We'll skip chapter 1. Titus chapter 2. But speak thou the things which come, uh, uh, the things which become sound doctrine. See this sound doctrine. 5198, sound doctrine. Sound in faith. Teach the sound doctrine. Who are going to be teaching the sound doctrine? The Luke group. The remnant Luke group. Listen to what he says. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Remember when he comes for 40 days? 2014, watch this. G2014, look at this. Luke 1, verse 79, to give light to them that sit in darkness. <laughs> I love it. And what is he doing? Appear When he appears to all men, right? When Christ came the first time, it's not that he appeared unto all men, but he's going to be going around as the son of man. He's not coming and saying, I am the Lord and I am the Christ. No, he's coming as the son of man to fulfill the story of Jonah for 40 days. And when he does, he's coming to shine his light in the darkness. And he's beginning his 40 days, just as we know in Luke 1. And here he is in Titus with them who are of a sound foundation a sound doctrine and look at what happens next teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust we should live soberly righteously and godly in this present world looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing listen to this and the glorious appearing g 2015 this glorious appearing, look at where it is. In 2 Thessalonians 2.8, listen to what it says. And then shall the wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. This is the Lord coming, post-trib, feet down on the Mount of Olives, when he's coming in the brightness of his coming, when he's as lightning from one end unto the other. So what is he telling us? It starts by his appearing to this group and telling them how to live and, and they'll be like Christ and all of those things, living as Christ for Christ until the blessed hope <coughs> of the appearing of the great God and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Because why? Do you remember what happens to this group when the Lord returns? Of course you do. They're the priestly line. They're the royal priesthood. They're the, 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 the Luke 24. They're the uh, Church of Smyrna. They're the lighted candle. They're the ones who have part in the first resurrection who will be reigning with Christ as priests. And so they're looking for the glorious appearing. And listen to what it says in verse 14. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem that he might ransom us, that he might redeem us. We covered that one earlier. From all iniquity and purify unto himself. Look at this. A peculiar people 
zealous of good works. Now, when you read this peculiar people, I'll bet you you think it's the other one. Do you want to know how spectacular this one is? It's even more particular than the other one was. Remember the other one? Watch this. Uh, wait a second. This peculiar people, watch this. <clears throat> watch this, right? So we see it, we saw it in 1 Peter 1 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, okay? That you should show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now, you want to see this peculiar people? This is them at the end, remember? This is the M at their at their redemption after his appearing post-trib. And listen to what it says about this peculiar people. Be, let me show you something. Remember in 1 Peter? Where did it say it was? 1 Peter 2, 9. Let me show you the difference. I want you to comprehend the difference of this word. Okay? This peculiar people. There it is right there. Okay? In an acquisition. The purchased possession. This is like that pre-portion of it, right? Now watch what happens. That one's used five times. Look what happens to this one as we close this out in Titus chapter 2 of those with sound doctrine, the Luke group, his, his remnant workers, to purify unto himself a peculiar people. Do you know that if you don't have a, a Strong's Concordance at your fingertips, you're going to think that it, it's just the same thing. Even though it's the same group, it's much more specific to them. This is them at the end when they will get their redemption. When, well, not just the redemption. When they will get their resurrection. And listen to what it says. It's only used one time. Beyond, being beyond usual, that is special one's own. Wow. Brothers and sisters, Man, like I said, I can keep going for another three hours in this, but I hope and pray you saw the picture of tonight's topic, the the title of Out of Darkness into His Marvelous Light, whatever that title along those lines may be. Brothers and sisters, we are a group of people being prepared. Whether we are preparing and readying a group, strengthening them in Christ, letting them know the season and time is at hand, that hopefully we're preparing thousands and tens of thousands of people around the world to be prayerfully accounted worthy to be in the lowest room of the third heaven and that with the rest of us we are being prepared in christ jesus in the revelation of sound doctrine to be a royal priesthood a peculiar people for christ being prepared for the end of days a special people a special, beyond usual, one's own, like those who would sit with him in his throne. Brothers and sisters, I love you. God bless you. It was a late one tonight. It's almost one in the morning. I got a late start. It was a family dinner night. So with that, I love you guys. God bless you. Bye for now.